Hello, students. I'm back finally. I, I really want to apologize for the delay in getting these lectures um, recorded for you all. Um, it was absolutely not my intention. Um, I also wanted to say that I just really appreciate um, all of the caring and support and patience you all have shown me. Um, I really, 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 really greatly appreciate that. Um, it wasn't what I was looking for. I was really just um, hoping to let you all know that I'm not trying to blow you off, that you are important to me and that this class is important to me. Um, and I also wanted to say that I hope that each and every one of you are thinking um, of your classmates with the same type of concern and care that you've shown me. I think that we're all dealing with some very difficult things right now. Um, so if we can, as a community, kind of be sending our warm thoughts and support across the Canvas page to one another, um, I just think that that's the best thing that we can do um, as a community right now. Anyways, I'm done lecturing um, on moral things, and I'm going to start lecturing on our topic. Um, today, we're going to finish up talking about independence in Latin America, and I'm also going to talk about abolition. Now, independence and abolition do not take place at the same time. Um, this is the same as it takes place in the United States. However, there are some very major differences to what happens in Latin America to what happens in the United States. So um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit so we can get the comparison and contrast going with our own U.S. history. Um, but um, I'd like you all to be kind of thinking about the similarities and differences between our own kind of independence and process of abolishing slavery and the independence and process of abolishing slavery in Latin America. Okay, so let's get started. Before we discuss, um, before we move on, um, we're approaching the midterm pretty quickly. So I wanted to go ahead and do a quick um, review, kind of throwing out some of the things that you should be thinking about studying um, for your midterm, okay? So we start with the encounter between three cultures, the Iberian culture, the Amerindians, and the Africans. <clears throat> we can define the Iberian culture as one of conquest. So um, remember that the Iberians had to reconquest their own peninsula from the Moors. And after doing so, the valoration of military men um, became greater to the fact that they could raise their social status through um, being through military valor. And because of this, it kind of pushes this conquistador type um, type culture across the peninsula. You also have the strong relationship between the Catholic churches and the monarchs and the idea that the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula um, was proving that the Catholic God was the true God, the powerful God. Um, the Iberian culture is hierarchical. Remember, you have about 2% of um, the population owned, owning over 95% of the farmland. Um, so super um, inequality. Um, and you also have the age of exploration coming right on the heels of the reconquest where European powers in general are looking to expand um, and looking to explore new places in the world, mostly Asia and Africa, they're looking for luxury items, spices, gold, precious metal, other precious metals, things of that nature. Um, the Amerindians, like the Iberians, are also hierarchical cultures. Um, they're polytheistic, meaning they worship numerous gods. We talked about how there are some differences between these polytheistic religions, but they are all worshiping many gods. We discussed some of the features of the Aztec Empire, the Inca Empire, 
the Maya civilization, as well as the Amazonian peoples. So those are all things that I suggest you review. Um, the Africans, we have another hierarchical society that's polyistic, polytheistic some, and others are Muslim already. Um, and then still others at the time of the arrival of the Portuguese mainly are going to convert to Catholicism as took place in the kingdom of the Congo. I would review that story as well as um, just some of the aspects of the Songhe empire that we talked about, okay? Next is the Spanish conquest in the new world. So I would review Christopher Columbus and his arrival at Hispaniola and what happened um, and how he conquered the island. Um, this is also where the slave trade begins. I would um, review why that happened. Um, if you remember, um, they pressed the indigenous peoples of Hispaniola into um, mining gold and basically wiped the population out. And that's why the Spanish began to allow the importation of African slaves into the colonies in the New World. Next, we talked about Hernán Cortés and his conquest of New Spain. So I would review the conquest of Tenochtitlan and the role that Doña Marina played. Um, then you have Francisco Pizarro and the Inca Empire. Um, now, after the conquest of the Inca Empire, there are some issues with between the conquistadors and the crown. Um, I would review that. That leads to the passage of the new laws and the laws of Borjos. Um, and both of those have to do with some of these new debates that emerge in Europe. Um, such as a debate over whether indigenous peoples are in fact human or not, and also the debate over the conquest. Also, I, you need to recall that Brazil has a different history. The Portuguese and indigenous peoples had pretty friendly relationships to begin with. Um, there was no war of conquest in Brazil as there was um, across Spanish America. Um, indeed, the Portuguese and the indigenous peoples in Brazil, the Tupinamba, um, they worked together um, harvesting Brazil wood. Now, eventually, um, the practice becomes more exploitative. The Portuguese begin seriously exploiting the laborers. Um, by this time, there are too many Portuguese men and they're too integrated, like they have concubines and wives um, who are indigenous and their children are mixed race. And so they're too um, entwined into these communities at this point for there to be a real rebellion. So it's squashed very quickly. Um, over time, Brazil begins to develop its monopoly um, on the sugar trade in the Northeast. And that is when um, the Portuguese begin importing massive amounts of slaves to Northeastern Brazil. So how does colonial trade work? If you remember the colonial powers in, impose this system called mercantilism, a trade system in which colonies exist solely for, um, to enrich mother countries so they provide raw material, cheap raw materials um, for, European factories and they buy manufactured European goods. Triangular trade is this pattern of trade that arises from the colonial trade patterns and mercantilism where manufactured goods head from Europe both to the Americas and also to Africa while raw, raw materials are headed back to Europe and to Africa and slaves are coming from Africa to the new world. Um, there are some slaves headed into Europe, um, but there are not as many slaves in Europe. Um, they're more house slaves. They work in houses. They, there aren't as many out on plantations um, in Europe. 
maybe in Spain and Portugal some, but not in Great Britain. And that we'll get a little bit more to that. Um, that helps to explain why the British become the first major power to push an end um, to slavery. The Royal Fifth is also very important. The Royal Fifth is how the crown um, profited off of its colonies in the New World and their production in raw materials. The Royal Fifth was the one-fifth tax on silver to begin with, but it also applies to sugar and gold and all other raw materials that are exported back to Europe. They take a 20% tax. They own 20% of it. That's the Royal Fifth. In Spanish America, silver is king. It is the primary resource that um, the Spanish are after um, once settlement really begins to take hold. Um, and they realize that gold is far more difficult and far less plentiful. Um, the fleet system is how the Spanish tried to both protect their commerce, but also ensure that they could collect their royal fifth by requiring um, all transatlantic voyages to meet in Havana to pass the to cross the Atlantic with them all together with a with the an armada export or escort export escort is the word that I mean. Um, and in Brazil, you have an economy that is really based around the sugar plantations and the slave economy in the Brazilian Northeast. As the Brazilian, as Brazil begins to expand into the interior, this is when they discover gold and gold for a short time becomes a major export for the Brazilians. Vice royalties in the colonies developed around collecting the Royal Fifth. So if sugar, or so if silver is king in in Spanish America, then the first two vice royalties will be the vice royalty of New Spain and the vice royalty of Peru. Next came the vice royalty of New Granada, and the vice royalty of New Granada was created um, after gold was discovered. Um, and then the Vice Royalty of Rio de la Plata down in Argentina that was created um, to help stop the silver um, from evading the Royal Fifth by sneaking down the rivers and out through Buenos Aires um, and avoiding that fleet system. Uh, Brazil has fewer Vice Royalties and their Vice Roys are much less, um, have much less authority. Um, and the the authority, the colonial authority is originally in that northeast around Salvador, um, as when sugar rules the economy. But later, when the emperor comes, Rio de Janeiro and those lower um, vice royalties are going to become more powerful. Here we have core in areas versus fringe areas. So these core areas are these more urban areas where the Spanish, where there are more Spanish people or Portuguese people living, um, more Europeans anyway. Um, these are the areas that produce um, the primary um, exports. So we're talking silver and uh, sugar. And so these core areas would be say Mexico City, um, or Lima, Peru, or Potosi, or Buenos Aires. Well, the fringe areas have very little colonial administration, very little um, resources that the Spanish and the Portuguese are interested in. And so um, those fringe areas tend to not um, be quite as Hispanicized or Iberianized, however you want to put that. Um, you have conflicts between Creoles or the native sons who are European descendants born in the New World and peninsulars, um, those Europeans who come and settle in the New World after being born in Spain or Portugal, because they're competing over control over um, for these high administrative posts that can become very lucrative, right? Colonial society in Latin America is made up of a caste system. Limpieza de sangre or pure European descent, pure whiteness um, is a sign of being in the elite class. Um, wealth also helps determine um, elite status. 
castas are those of mixed race. So you have mestizos who are European and indigenous or mulatos who are European and African descendants. Um, you have the concept of hegemony where the Spanish and the Iberians are attempting to gain, con are, are gaining some consent from the indigenous peoples and the Africans for the culture, for the administration and for the economics and labor systems that they are putting in place in the new world. With this comes the patriarchy where, you know, men rule, uh, women are considered um, poor and dependent. Um, and the richer a woman was, the actual less, actually the less freedom she had, the more elite she was. And then there's the concept of transculturation where it's not that the Spanish and Portuguese came in and replaced indigenous and African cultures. It's that those indigenous African and European cultures combined together to create a new Latin American culture. The Catholic Church um, and its role in the colonial project is something that you should be aware of before you approach your, your test. So papal domination is the, was, um, how do I explain this? So the papal domination given to Queen Isabella after the Reconquista was kind of the Catholic Church's um, the Catholic Church saying you have permission to spread Catholicism around the world and to represent um, like you are the Catholic monarchs. Um, the requirement is the document that came out of some of these debates about the humanity of indigenous peoples and the conquest, which was the document that conquistadors had to read before they, before they conquered new peoples. Um, telling them that they needed to accept Jesus, you know, the Catholic God, and they needed to accept um, the Spanish monarch or um, they would be destroyed. Um, evangelization is a big part of the papal domination. So Queen Isabella and the Spanish are required to evangelize the natives. And there are challenges and solutions to this evangelization project. You should be um, reviewing those. Remember that the Catholic Church um, is given agrarian tithes, the largest um, revenue source in the new world. And so it becomes a huge economic institution with a lot of wealth and power and the largest landowner in Latin America during the colonial era. Um, it also controls education for all castes and is, as such, um, one of the institutions that comes to the new world that helps to promote this Iberian cultural hegemony in the region. When we come upon the Bourbon reforms, and this is in the late colonial period. And this is a time when the Bourbon monarchs take the throne first in France and then in the Iberian Peninsula. And these Bourbon monarchs really, really view um, the possessions in the New World not as separate kingdoms with equal status to the Iberian kingdoms, but as um, colonies created to enrich the mother country. So their overarching goal is to reassert their royal control over the colonies. So they increase taxes on all castes. Through regalism, they're attempting to assert control over the Catholic Church. They increase preferential treatment for peninsularis over Creoles because they're seen as more loyal to the crowd than these native sons. It bans manufacturing activities in the Americas. It increases the presence of the Royal Army in the, America, in the Americas, mostly through recruitment. It modernizes the bureaucracy, mining and agricultural techniques um, to increase Royal revenues. And the Creoles are going to chafe against all of these changes. At the same time that the Bourbon reforms are taking place, the Enlightenment is coming to, 
to light is becoming a popular philosophy in Europe. The Enlightenment's an 18th century European philosophy that says that knowledge focus, you need to focus your knowledge around logical re reasoning and the scientific method. It also advocates ideas such as personal liberties, so property rights, free speech, freedom of religion, um, freedom, you know, due process, all of these things, as well as popular sovereignty. And popular sovereignty basically means that power is vested in the people, not in some monarch that is supposedly chosen by God. Um, and those who are chosen to govern over the people only act as trustees of the sovereign will of the people. So this is kind of the, this is the idea that the United States Constitution is based on. So the idea is that our elected officials are supposed to act as trustees of our will. Um, I'll leave that up to you all as to how much you think that our politicians um, do or do not do that for us. <laughs> um, I won't opine myself here. Um, there's also the idea of the equality of men, like in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. And so the, the idea that enlightenment thinkers believed this and led these revolutions and then didn't immediately abolish slavery is a little contradictory, a little controversial. And that's why we talk about, um, that's why we'll talk about abolition separately today. Um, excuse me. So we come, the Enlightenment sparks an age of Atlantic revolutions. These are revolutions across the Atlantic world in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And they're based on the ideas of the Enlightenment. So the first is the American Revolution, which is an inspiration to the Creoles who are chafing against the Bourbon reforms. We have the French Revolution, which the Declaration of the Rights of Man is a very inspirational document. However, it's the invasion of Iberia and um, that really sets off the autonomy movements in the new world. And that's the main influence that the French Revolution has on Latin America. It also causes the, sparks the Haitian Revolution, which is the first Latin American country to become independent. Um, but the Haitian Revolution, which we're about to get to, actually acts as a deterrent, um, particularly for elites in those core areas. Um, that we talked about. And then the Spanish-American re revolutions kind of um, come, in, come on the end um, and close out this age of Atlantic revolutions. So today we're going to, so we're now going to continue our discussion with independence. So let's go back and review Brazil. And Emperor Zhao flees, flees Portugal for Rio de Janeiro when Napoleon invades. He gives Brazil this autonomy that the Creoles are asking for by elevating the kingdom of Brazil to equal status with the Portuguese. This is what those Spanish rebels want. They open free trade with other European powers for Brazilians. This is another feature of autonomy. They're no longer um, having to trade only with Portugal. They can now trade with Great Britain or the Americans or um, the French or the Spanish. Um, this is another thing that the Spanish rebels really wanted in Spanish America. He returns to Portugal to put down a, liber a liberal rebellion, leaving his son Dom Pedro I as his regent. Um, Dom Pedro faces a rebellion from Creoles who are upset about the preferential treatment given Peninsulares, but also um, his decision um, to end the transatlantic tr slave trade under British pressure, um, and as a, and to try to tamp down the rebellion, he declares independence for the Brazilian Empire in 1822. Um, so there's some conflict in Brazil, but there's no widespread independence war um, such that will engulf much of Spanish America. So this is where we left off yesterday. We've got wealthy Creoles resenting Bourbon reforms, elites in fringe areas resenting elites in core areas because they have all these trade preferences. We have the courts of Cadiz, um, those cortes that um, 
that were organized in Spain following um, following Napoleon's invasion. Um, they refused to allow representatives from the colonies in Americas. And then you have the inspiration of the Enlightenment, the American and the American and French revolutions. I mean revolutions, right? You guys got that, okay. Check your work, I should check mine too. <laughs> anyway, the and we talked about some of these early pushes for independence that, and remember all of these have pretty much been quashed by the Spanish army by 1815. So first, we have Mexico, the rebellion led by Father Miguel Hidalgo and Father Jose Maria Morelos. Later, we have Venezuela and the rebellion led by Simon Bolivar. He fails in this early attempt because he, he fails to gain support from elites in the interior agricultural areas, so like the large landowners. In Argentina, the Creoles are able to kick the peninsulars out of Buenos Aires, but in the interior, the elites remain loyal to the crown. In core areas like New Spain or Mexico and Peru, um, many of the elites are very, very cautious and wait a very long time to, um, to discuss independence because they retain these memories of earlier rebellions um, and they fear that they're going to, without the Spanish, lose control over indigenous mixed race and African masses. There's also the Haitian Revolution and the violence of the Haitian Revolution um, that deters them. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, when we get to abolition. But for right now, I wanna go ahead and kind of finish the story of independence in South America and the Mexican empire. So after those early failures, Independence leaders in Latin America develop a new strategy, and this new strategy is known as nativism. Nativism um, was supposed to help these elites gain popular support for their bids for independence from Spain. So nativism is a political strategy that promotes an Americano idea identity versus a European identity. Um, basically claiming that all of those born in the new world are in conflict with foreign Spanish colonizers. The first use of nativism is actually during the rebellion of fathers Hidalgo and Morelos in Mexico, but this becomes much more widespread after 1815. Um, Simón Bolívar picks it up. You'll see José Martí. Um, he will use nativism. And um, you'll see that when we get into uh, your module activity, or you should see, have seen that if you've already done so, um, that you'll be using, uh, you'll be looking kind of how nativism played a role in the discourse of independence. So here we have Simon Bolivar. He had the early defeat by Ferdinand VII's forces but he uses nativism to attract the agricultural elite to his independence cause. By 1822, Bogota, Caracas, and Quito have all fallen. Um, and in 1824, Simon Bolivar liberates Bolivia and Peru. He is known as the liberator. Next, you have Jose de San Martin. He's a seasoned military leader and he um, helps he helps liberate Argentina from the Spanish. Um, so he actually gets funding from the elites in Buenos Aires. Um, he liberates um, the rest of Argentina or Rio de la Plata and then heads over to Chile where he becomes bogged down. And despite meeting with Bolivar and Bolivar like trying to persuade him to stay in the fight, he just gives up and flees to Europe. He's known as the protector, ironically. <laughs> now, the case of New Spain is quite different. Um, in New Spain, independence is actually declared by a former loyalist, a military general named Agustin de Iterbide. Um, he had actually distinguished himself in the eyes of the crown for by putting down the early rebellion 
of Father Zidalgo and Morelos, Morelos. So he wasn't an early freedom fighter. Um, but in 1821, the separatists gained the upper hand over the loyalists. And the elites in New Spain decide that they're going to try to negotiate um, with each other and with the crown um, for some sort of autonomy, but without leaving the empire. And this is issued in what's known as the Plan of Iguala. And it was the compromise and it called for complete self-rule in Spain, but they would still recognize Ferdinand VII as ruler actually wanted to give him um, the title of the emperor of New Spain, but Spain refused. They didn't want them to be um, at all autonomous from Spain. And so popular unrest grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, and grew until um, they throw out the Spanish and just crown Iturbide as the first um, emperor of Mexico. So the first emperor, the first leader of what is the Mexican empire for a very brief time. Um, this actually includes uh, Central America down to what is now the border of Panama. Now, these patriot and loyalist armies um, <clears throat> include indigenous peoples, free and enslaved blacks and castas, providing a chance for social mobilization. So even though elites are leading these armies, the bulk of the forces are these castas um, and these, these lower classes. They recruited men um, from far away to serve in distant regions. So they would recruit someone in Rio de la Plata and send him to Venezuela to fight. Um, and this would lessen the chances that they would desert um, but it also in, increased instances of disease, malnutrition, and death because they didn't have their families nearby to help supply them. As in most wars, all wars, women suffer the most, um, but many of them participated. Um, a few famous examples here, this picture is of Manuela Sainz. Uh, she was Bolivar's mistress and worked closely with the liberator, helping to kind of persuade and spy on the elite in Lima. And then in Mexico, we have the famous wife of the corregidor of Quintero, who acted as a spy for patriot troops. Um, you also have women who are doing things like bringing supplies and food, acting as nurses, um, trying to save people's lives, um, taking care, trying to defend their homes and whatever livelihoods and their children um, as the wars are raging. So women play a role um, in these wars, if, even if they are not often spoken about. So as you can see, most of Latin America is independent by this time, but just because they've gained their independence, old hierarchical social structures are going to maintain a lot of, rev a lot of relevance. You're still going to have elites relying on enslaved and indigenous labor. You're still going to have these racial and class categories into castes. And the struggle to decolonize Latin American politics, society, and economics wore on long past independence, some would argue even until this day. When you have, you know, African, when you have Black and Indigenous movements screaming that we've been suffering for 500 years, right? So they're not talking about, um, a, an oppression that is new from a current government. They're discussing the oppression that they feel now as a, as a remnant of this old colonial um, system, if that makes any sense. So that's independence. Now we're gonna talk about abolition. I'm gonna do a little bit of a review about the transatlantic slave trade. We'll talk about the Haitian revolution and then we'll talk about abolition throughout the rest of Latin America. So some of the independence leaders, Simon Bolivar included, actually supported immediate emancipation. Um, however, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of pushback from 
you guessed it, wealthy slave owners um, who want to continue to be wealthy slave owners. So new liberal constitutions reflect ideas of popular sovereignty, but they're very limited. They don't abolish slavery and they're limited in many of the same ways as they were in the United States. Like women can't vote, indigenous people can't vote, black people can't vote. Um, if you don't own property, you can't vote, all of these things. Um, in fact, the abolition and what's different about abolition in the United States versus what happens in most of Latin America is that in the United States, there's a civil war that abolishes slavery. It's like a one and done thing. Um, in Latin America, there's this process where through legislation, um, slavery slowly comes to an end. So here are these two maps and I wanna put them side to side because I want you to see um, why one of the factors that contributes to when um, a country actually finally abolished slavery. So if you look at this map here on the right hand side, you can see numbers of enslaved people who were brought across the Atlantic Ocean from Africa. So you can see that the regions that have the largest volume of slaves arriving, enslaved persons arriving are the US South, the Caribbean islands, um, and Brazil. And if you look at this map on the left, um, those countries that abolished slavery earlier had a lower volume of slaves to begin with, while the countries who abolished slavery later had a higher volume of slaves. Therefore, they were much more economically dependent on the institution of slavery. But they're also, um, <clears throat> but they're also much more afraid of what will happen if um, slaves are given their freedom. One of the reasons they're so afraid is the Haitian Revolution. So just to review what we've already talked about, it's the first successful independence movement in Latin America, the only successful slave revolt in world history, and the first independent Black nation in the world. We'll see that racial violence um, during the revolution is going to increase the fears of colonial elites over slave and or popular rebellions. Um, the Haitian Revolution is incredibly interesting. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the French caste system um, because the racial kind of categories in the French colonies were very different, uh, were a little bit different than they were in the Spanish colonies or in the rest of the United, what would become the United States. Mike Duncan's Revolutions podcast does a season on the Haitian Revolution that is really great. Um, if you want to check that out, I highly recommend it. So let's start with the colony of French Saint-Domingue. All right, it Saint-Domingue is actually on the island of Hispaniola. Um, when the gold runs out, the Spanish kind of just let the French take over the western half of the island. Um, enslaved Blacks and Africans make San domingue the most prof profitable colony in the Western Hemisphere very quickly. It was the number one market for the transatlantic slave trade. And coffee and sugar produced by slave labor accounted for two thirds of France's overseas trade. So that's from all of its territories. And the French Revolution causes a split in the elite on Saint Domingue between those who are loyal to the royal, to the crown, and those who are patriots and in favor of the revolution. Conflict between these elites causes creates this opportunity and in 1791 the slaves of San Domingue launch a rebellion. So a little bit about um, slavery um, under the French Code Noir, which is a slave code. 
Um, we had them in the United States. The Virginia Slave Code is the most famous and it is one of the first, and um, slave codes are actually the documents that help um, that help to solidify the idea of race um, in the new world. Um, so the French Code Noir is a 1685 edict from King Louis XIV himself. It both regulates and protects the institution of slavery in the French colony. It begins the law of the womb, um, that practice of hereditary enslavement that we've already talking about. Um, it forbids slaves from congregating, carrying weapons, participating in commerce, participating in legal proceedings as the defendant or the plaintiff, or even marrying without permission. Those are some of the ways that um, the, the Code Noir protects slavery or um, <clears throat> regulates slavery. Some of the ways that it protects the institution of slavery is by forbidding masters from freeing slaves without permission, discouraging Frenchmen from taking enslaved women as concubines or wives, forbidding punishments like mutilation without permission from an authority, um, keeping encouraging them to keep enslaved families together, um, and requiring masters to convert the enslaved to the Catholic faith. It also instituted harsh punishments for rebellious slaves or runaways. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those. By 1789, Haiti is, or Saint-Domingue is home to half a million slaves. Um, Saint-Domingue has the highest mortality rate for enslaved Africans in the Western Hemisphere. Half died within just a few years of their arrival. Um, some of the common punishments were torture, uh, beatings, whippings, burnings, brandings, amputations, and rape. Um, one of the more unsavory things that they would do is muzzle slaves who were caught eating sugar cane in the field. Um, and as you see here, this is a flogging being carried out by a slave who is an overseer who has power over another slave. This is one of the ways um, that they kind of get a sort of consent from the enslaved. It's... Ugh. But despite these conditions, there is pre-revolutionary resistance to the institution of slavery. And almost 50,000 slaves escaped over the time um, that Saint-Domingue was a slave colony. These, these escaped slaves are known as Maroons and they would form settlements very far from the French and occasionally conduct raids for supplies and weapons on plantations. Um, enslaved people rebelled by poisoning their masters, um, other slaves and livestock. Poisoning was so common that um, poison was actually made illegal on Saint-Domingue. And then enslaved people would often set fire to fields and plantation homes um, just to destroy the wealth of their masters. Another form of resistance was the maintenance of African cultures. So Haitian voodoo grew from a combination of African religious practices and the Catholicism the masters tried to um, push upon them. Um, so as you can see in the picture up top, you have Catholic um, and voodoo symbols alongside each other in this altarpiece. So enslaved Blacks and Africans in Haiti, and this is true kind of throughout Latin America, would meet on Sundays, the day of rest, to practice voodoo. And these meetings would not only be places where they could practice their own cultures, but they were places where they could organize together and plan resistance movements. And so legend has it that the night before the slave, rev slave revolt that began the Haitian Revolution, um, there was a voodoo ritual called Bois um, that was performed that's, that told the Haitian slaves that it was time to rebel. Um, and if you look closely in the picture, you will see a priestess standing by the fire. She's dressed in red. Um, supposedly, she's possessed by the soul of this black pig that they murdered. 
Um, and, and that the soul of the pig was a God that told them that they would be victorious. And so on the next morning, the slave revolt began. Now, the war is very, 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 very complicated. Um, the slave rebellion continues and it drags on, but in 1794, the French in the midst of their popular revolution abolish slavery in the colonies and designate all freed blacks and Africans as French citizens. Now free people of color, um, they're mostly mulattoes, um, but they were freed um, blacks or mulattoes basically. They join white plantation owners in opposing abolition because many of them themselves own slaves. So led by Toussaint Louverture, Black and African Haitians and their Patriot allies defeat the French and their allies on the island and gain control of the island of Hispaniola. However, he does not declare independence. He's afraid if he declares independence, not only will the French um, be fighting against him, but other European powers will try to prevent this from, from happening as well. So he's very careful not to declare outright independence. When Napoleon comes to power, Louverture is afraid that he'll reinstate slavery. So he organizes a constituent assembly and writes a constitution. Didn't declare Haiti independence, it, independent, it just declared a special set of rules for, for Haiti's part in the Caribbean of the French empire. So all men are born free and equal and it established private property rights. It abolished slavery, but because the plantation economy was so um, important, Louverture forced Blacks and Africans to return to some of the same plantations where they worked on before the revolution. However, they were not slaves and they, were, um, and they did have slightly improved working conditions. Napoleon tries to respond or responds by trying to take over the island and the general he sends Rochambeau is notorious for his brutality. Um, Louverture is killed and a new leader Jean-Jacques Dessalines becomes takes over the fight and in 1804 Dessalines declares independence for Haiti. Under Rochambeau, um, the French forces commit numerous atrocities and Dessalines responds by ordering his two troops to attack white French people on the island. Once they gained independence, um, Dessalines viewed the white French as a threat to national security. He would prevent them from leaving the island and ordered the massacre of all white people on the island. By the end, almost all the whole white population of Haiti had been completely wiped out. And white French people who did manage to escape took stories of massacres to slave holding elites in countries where slavery was um, still a big deal, including the United States, Cuba, Brazil, and, and elsewhere. Like the Haitian slaves, African and black enslaved persons in the main, on the mainland, so in South America, in Central America, in New Spain, they also resisted. As the independence and broke out and then the civil wars continued after independence, it increased their opportunities to escape. All of the wars opened opportunities um, for enslaved Blacks and Africans to negotiate better working, condition, working conditions with their slave owners who wanted them to stay. Um, they also formed organizations you have and, and um, have their own cultural traditions like Santeria in, in Cuba or um, some of the other African traditions that you can find in Brazil. Um, that was done throughout. And um, they were also given the opportunity to serve both in Patriot and um, Royalist armies. Um, and then the liberal and conservative armies that fought in the civil wars um, to gain their independence. Um, many did so. Um, black mixed race and indigenous 
soldiers are the majority of the fighters on the front lines. Um, and they were often um, not given weapons and used as cannon fodder. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily a great way to go about trying to, to earn one's freedom. So as I say, patriots and royalists offer freedom for serving in independence wars, liberals and conservatives offer freedom for serving in the civil wars. Um, as the wealthy plantation owners oppose abolition, liberals become more and more likely to support abolition. And they begin um, a process of gradual emancipation um, that cycles through civil, the civil wars um, and into the national legislation. So between 1807 and 1815, all of the countries in the Western Hemisphere ended the transatlantic slave trade, although illegal trade from Africa continued, um, the British would actually patrol um, the Atlantic Ocean looking for illegal um, transatlantic slave ships. Um, in between the time of the end of the slave trade and the beginning of abolition, which are the 18 and, and final abolition, which for some is the 1820s, for some is the 1840s, for other it's the 1880s. Um, they began to pass these laws that gradually allow more and more people to escape slavery. So free birth laws in the practice of hereditary slavery. It often, however, tied the children of enslaved mothers to their owner's plantation until a determined made age of majority. No, it's not 16. No, it's not 18. Some of the, one of the lowest ages of majority was 25, meaning that they were still working and on this plantation as a slave until they were 25. In some places, I think Peru, the age, this age of majority was 50 years old. So it's your entire working life, right? Um, so not, not the best, but it does in the practice of hereditary slavery. Um, and then there are a set of laws that provide emancipation for enslaved persons above a certain age. Some of the lowest were 50 and some of the oldest were 80. And I don't know how many people you knew who were, how many people um, in history were living till 80 years old in the 19th century. There were some, but not that many. And they certainly weren't um, weren't very many who were working as slaves on plantations doing backbreaking work day in and day out with nothing, you know, with very little rest and very little medical care and no, yeah. So I just, just think about how much, how serious these laws were at emancipating people. Now, there are some exceptions. These are the, the last countries in the hemisphere to abolish slavery. So in quote, in, you know, in parentheses, we have the United States. The United States is very far behind um, a lot of the other countries. It's, it's the fourth to the last country in the Western hemisphere to abolish slavery. Um, and it's the central cause of the United States only civil war. The, you, you can, um, I, I invite any of you who would like to challenge me on that fact um, to do so. It's not something um, that I was taught in school. It's something that I have since discovered. And if you would like for me um, to give you some of that information so that you too can discover it, I would be happy to just shoot me an email. Anyway, back to Latin America. So, Part of the reason that Cuba and, and Puerto Rico um, do not abolish slavery until so late is because they remain Spanish colonies until 1898. The Spanish abolished slavery in Puerto Rico in 1873 as a way um, to kind of, as a way to lessen the power of the planters who want independence. And then in, in Cuba, you have the fir a first independence movement that begins in 1868 that's known as the Ten Years' War um, that begins with Carlos Manuel de Cespedes declaring independence and freeing his slaves. He actually gets a lot of pushback from elites on the island for um, wanting to emancipate 
the slaves. And um, for that reason, his 10 years war ends in 1878 with little success. But during the 10 years war in 1870, a free market law begins to free young and old enslaved people and any who fight for the Spanish. And later the Spain puts a six year um, time limit on how much longer, how long masters have to kind of rework their plantations around freed labor. Um, but they don't make it to, to the six year mark. Um, the C Cuban fight for independence is, and push for independence is so strong by 1886 that the Spanish abolished slavery, you know, to try to get the loyalty of, if, of these freed slaves freed former slaves. Now Brazil also has a gradual process of emancipation. But remember, Brazil doesn't have any independence wars and they don't really fight any civil wars. So there aren't a lot of opportunities for gaining freedom through warfare or through escape in Brazil. Um, but it passes through a stage of three laws in 1871. Um, the free womb law ends hereditary slavery. In 1884, the sexagenarian law and frees enslaved people once they turn 60. And then in 1886, the golden law abolished slavery um, finally. So that is independence and abolition. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some of the assignments you had for this week. If you haven't gotten to them or you need to get, or after this lecture, you'd like to get back to them, please, 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 please do so. Um, I don't have a problem with that. And um, if I get to grading this week's assignments and I see that my failure to get um, this lecture up sooner has caused uh, problems for you all. Um, I'll think about um, reopening those assignments and allowing some of you to resubmit them. We'll see. We'll see how we do. I actually think that you all will be fine, but I just want. Um, but I don't. I want to make sure we're fair. Um, so, anyways, as I have mentioned before, your module activity will have you look at nativism in the writings of a Cuban independence le leader, Jose Martin. And then for your Latin American thought activity three, the summary and the analysis, I, you need to read the work. This is the time where you, you need to actually read the piece you've been assigned. Um, you should write me a summary that tells me both that you read and you understood your assigned writing. Um, this is a good time for you guys to start asking me questions if there are things you don't understand about your reading. Um, and then the quotes you choose should address the prompt, the legacies of colonialism in Latin America very directly. Um, you should attempt to use the historical background and the biographies of your intellectuals um, to connect the quote to the themes we've covered in class so far um, to the best of your ability. I don't expect you to be spot on and perfect yet. Um, you know, this is a chance to get comments from me, which you will be getting um, at the start of this week. The rest of the day, I am just going to try to get as much as I can um, up to them. I'm going to try to finish posting everything up through the midterm so that you guys aren't held back um, in proceeding through the class. And then um, by tomorrow afternoon, I should be in and, and grading, 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 grading. Okay. Um, so please forgive me for that. Um, as you see grades go up, don't hesitate to ask me why that's your grade. Um, I'm, I'm happy to help explain and uh, get in there and kind of check the comments that I'm leaving. The comments that I'm leaving will help you um, improve for the future. Um, assignments in my class. And I will absolutely keep in mind that I haven't been able to give you nearly as many comments as I've wanted to by this point. Okay. So thank you all for taking the time to view the lecture. And again, for all of your kind words and thoughts and prayers and patience and just the great work that I see you all doing so far, you should be proud of yourselves. 
this is not an, this is an extraordinary time and you are all proving to be extraordinary people. So until the next lecture, adios. <laughs>